Welcome everyone to the first lecture in uh, category theory for the NGA coursework uh, course in category theory. Uh, we had uh, some informal uh, engagements before this lecture, uh, which gave us a bit of a taste what uh, at least what categories are. Uh, and as you can imagine, category theory is a subject that studies categories. However, it doesn't study only categories. It also studies other uh, structures that are closely linked with categories. Um, and uh, in this lecture, therefore, one might think that we want to now depart from where we stopped in the informal sessions. Um, but actually, instead of that, we're going to restart one more and last time. Uh, we are going to now once again describe what categories are, but this time we will take quite a different approach to what we had before um, in, in two ways. One is that it's literally different and the other is that it, it's a bit more advanced and relies on knowledge of some other ideas in mathematics. So uh, there are two mathematical structures that I would like to um, propose that we look at before we look at the notion of a category. One is the structure of a monoid. What is a monoid? Well, a monoid is, as probably most of you know, it's, um, it's a set M with a binary operation that is supposed to be associative and for which we need to have an identity element. We can picture a monoid in a certain way. We can picture a monoid this way. We write down our um, M as a certain object. We can represent it by a dot. And then we picture elements of the monoid as arrows going, uh, looping into that dot. Now, the reason why we can picture a monoid this way is that, uh, in fact, every element X of a monoid can be seen as a map. Uh, it is the map that multiplies elements of the monoid by X. So uh, Y is mapped to X dot Y by the mapping X dot dash. And um, it turns out then that this correspondence uh, allows to present multiplication as composition of those mappings. So it turns out that uh, x dot dash as a map composed with y dot dash is actually the map x dot y dash. And this is very easy to confirm. You just plug in a variable there um, and, and evaluate the, the both sides of the equality. Um, so if I apply this function to a variable z on either side, let's see what we get. On the left side, we need to apply it successively. So we get uh, x dot y dot z. Uh, and on the right side, we just plug this dot inside the dash and we get x dot y dot z. And these two expressions are equal because uh, operation is associative. Um, and so we get that uh, we can, we get a representation of multiplication uh, operation of the monoid as a, as a composition of functions. Uh, and it is customary to represent functions as arrows, of course. So M is our set and these arrows represent functions from the set M to itself. And furthermore, the identity element of the monoid uh, seen as a function, uh, what it does, it maps every X to one dot X, which by the identity rule of the monoid is X. Therefore, we can think of this as um, as the identity function of M applied to X. So the identity element seen as a function is actually the identity function, the one that maps every X to itself. Okay, so this is, uh, in fact, a special case of a category. And for those who already know what it is, it's a category with just one object. 
another structure that I would like to look at is that of a pre-order. What is a pre-order? Well, it is a triple uh, P, um, a set P, and uh, well, actually not a triple. This time it's a it's a it's an ordered pair consisting of a set P and a binary relation on it. The binary relation needs to satisfy certain requirements, and these are that x is always less or equal to x, and that if x is less or equal to y and y is less or equal to z, then this should imply that x is less or equal to z. Now, once again, we can give a pictorial representation of a preorder uh, where uh, this time, instead of drawing P as a single dot, like we did here, where we drew the set as a single dot, instead of that, we will use dots to represent elements of P. And um, when one element X is less or equal to another element Y, we will represent this by drawing an arrow from X to Y. So for example, this transitivity rule for less or equal can be now represented by drawing an arrow from X to Y and an arrow from Y to Z, and then requiring that every time I have such two arrows, I necessarily need to have a third arrow that goes from X to Z. Of course, uh, the first axiom on a preorder ensures that uh, there is an arrow from every dot to itself since every element must be less or equal to itself. So there is something similar about these two pictures, this one and that one, and there is something dissimilar about them. Um, let's start with what is dissimilar. Here, we only have one object, one dot, and here we have several of them. So that is one thing that's dissimilar. Another thing that's dissimilar is that here, uh, from this object to itself, we, we can have many different arrows. Whereas on the other side, given to objects, I will always have at most one arrow. Why? Well, because we are, I only draw an arrow to represent the fact that x is less or equal to y. There is no need for drawing more than one arrow. So in a sense, uh, a monoid has many arrows and few objects, and a preorder has uh, many objects and few arrows. Okay, now let's see what is similar about them. So we talked what is dissimilar about these two pictures. Now let's talk about what is similar about them. Um, one similarity is that uh, just like here on this picture, we have one special arrow which which comes from the identity element of the monoid, the identity function in particular. Here we also seem to have a special arrow for every object, and we can call these special arrows. Um, we can give them a name that looks make, that makes make them look very similar to the other one to emphasize the analogy. And we can call these the identity arrows in the preorder. So that's one similarity that there seems to be a distinguished looping arrow from every object to itself. Another similarity is that if I have two arrows, now to show that similarity, I'm going to expand my uh, monoid diagram a bit. So let me draw multiple copies of M. And then if I have two arrows um, given by X dot dash and Y dot dash, I can compose them. I can compose them as functions. We now have them being composed in reverse order than what we wrote out here. I hope that's fine. Maybe it's not fine. Um, to make it a bit less confusing, let me switch around the order here. There we go. This composite of these two functions is then given by um, the x dot y element, right? And this situation is reminiscent of the transitivity rule here. 
when we said that every time I have an arrow there and there, um, there seems to be an arrow across. But still the difference is that here in this, in this setup, because we have many possible arrows running from M to M, we actually want to select one specific one that will be declared to be the product of those two, or in other words, the functional composite of those two. Here, there is no need to do that since the arrow is unique when it exists. But we could try to imitate the language of the monoid and say that on this diagram, if I have, let's say, arrows F and G, we could now uh, rephrase the transitivity rule for less or equal by saying that the two arrows should be composed. Then the composite will be uniquely determined because there is only one arrow, but still we can think of this as a composite of the other two arrows. Uh, there are two more things that are similar to these two situations. One is that uh, on this side of the monoid, uh, we have that, okay, let me now switch to the F and G notation also on the side of the monoid. So I want to think of this as uh, an arrow F and let me think of this as an arrow G. Then I, I want to think of this as G composed with F. This will actually be the usual composite of functions um, by the computation um, given here. The thing we discussed here was claiming that um, this function is actually the composite of those two functions. And then as we know very well, composition of functions um, obeys associativity law. H composed with G composed with F equals H composed with G composed with F. Let us draw a diagram that um, exhibits all the arrows involved in this uh, rule. So we will need four objects and three arrows, one arrow F, the other arrow G, and finally the arrow H. And then we can form the composite GF, form the composite HG, and then further form the composites of H with GF, and the composite of HG with F. And in the monoid situation, we've got them equal to each other. Now, let me ask you the following question. Do we have them equal to each other still in the pre-order situation? What do you think? Would anyone like to take my question? Um, yes, I think so, because uh, the pre-order relation is transitive and associative. <laughs> yeah, that, that's my question. Why is it associative? I think somebody had their hand raised, raised um, but now it's gone. Um, I can take a stab at it. I, I think it is associative because composition will always involve an identity arrow. So we are in a pre-order now. We have these objects in a pre-order are now possibly separate objects. Let's call them, let me switch to capital letter notation, X, Y, Z, and T. And I don't see what role do identity arrows play in the fact that in a pre-order, these two components are possibly equal to each other. Uh, yes, I agree. <laughs> but thank you for your input. Anyone else would like to give it a try?
Um, well, we know, well, for, first of all, we already implicitly assumed that is when we wrote x less than equal to y less than equal to z there. But we know that if, yeah, again, the, the transitivity of the pre-order relation kind of implies this, since we know that if z is less than t and y is less than z, less than the z, we know that y is less than t. But if we then we also know that x is less than y. We're not trying to demonstrate the existence of these errors. That we already yes, know we're trying we have. to show equality. Yeah, we want to show they're the same, yes. Yes, so if we have that they're equal and we have that unique errors exist, then they must be equal. That's right. So uh, we remarked that in a pre-order, given any two objects, there is always at most one error connecting them. And here we have two possible errors, that one and this one. But the presence of an arrow is just the statement that x is less or equal to t. And, and so when the arrow is present, there is only one arrow. That's how we build the arrow symbolism or the arrow uh, uh, notation representation of a preorder. So by the nature of what we agreed the arrows represent and, and how many of them there are, uh, these two arrows must be the same arrow since there is always at most one arrow between any every two objects. It, it's kind of for trivial reasons that uh, this equality still holds. And then the other thing that's similar about the two situations is, is the behavior of the identity arrows. So um, F composed with an identity arrow of an object X. In the case of a monoid, it's just uh, M, of course equals f and similarly identity arrow composed with f on the other side also equals f and if i draw diagrams um, exhibiting these equalities they will look as follows so i've got my object x uh, i've got my arrow f going from x to y and so i'm taking the identity arrow and composing it with f i'm getting some arrow here F composed with the identity arrow. Uh, that is equal to F when uh, this is usual composition of functions. That's a trivial fact. Why are these two things equal for a preorder? Well, for the same reason as before. Both F and the other composite, they both run from X to Y. And from X to Y, there is at most one arrow. So these two arrows must be the same. And then exactly the same argument will hold uh, for the other identity law, where we are composing um, f with the other identity, identity of y. So once again, this composite that will be formed will be an arrow from x to y, and therefore it must be the same arrow as f because there is always at most one arrow. Okay, so. Um, I think almost all of you already know what a category is, and, and now you can see how the notion of a category is emerging by trying to put the structure of a monoid and structure of preorder together, the kind of common generalization of the two structures. Uh, however, it did require us thinking in terms of arrows. So we can now describe what a category is. Uh, a category will consist of many objects, just like a preorder did. So instead of one object, in the case of a monoid, we have many objects, x, y, z, and, and more than that. These objects are represented by dots. And between every two dots, we can have many arrows. Moreover, whenever we have two arrows, f and g, arranged in the way that's displayed on this picture, where f goes to some object y and g goes out from that object, there needs to be a composition of those arrows defined. Uh, and that needs to be really defined and determined in advance. So you, you, we cannot change composition once we fix the composition only after that. And, and we have to fix that for every pair of arrows arranged in a diagram like this. Only after that, we, have, we can say that we, are, uh, we have a category. Uh, so in addition to, to fixing composites of, of arrows, we are also fixing identity, the so-called identity arrows. Just choose one random arrow that loops into each object and this 
choice needs to be done for every object. And then we require that um, composition and identity errors are chosen in such a way that associativity law holds. In other words, in every such diagram, those two composites are always equal. And also um, the identity laws hold. So F is equal to always to that composite and also to the, to the other composite. As a mathematical structure, I can write out a category in the following way. So if I go back here, notice how I write mathematical structures. So I write the, the main set. Um, in this case of a monoid, it, it was the set of points in the monoid or the set of elements in the monoid. In the case of a pre-order, it was the set of points in the pre-order. Then I had my multiplication operation. I had my identity element. Here I had my uh, binary relation of less or equal, right? So all the structural data that describes my my structure is kind of listed in a tuple. So let me try to imitate that in a category. Um, the, the only thing difference is that now a category will have more structural data than the other two had because a, a category is a richer structure than the other two on their own. So what kind of data do we have in a category? We have um, something that usually people call C0. This is the collection of objects of the category. In other words, the dots we've been drawing or things we've been labeling with capital or uh, letters. Um, so this is the collection of objects. It, it can be an abstract collection. We only start calling it objects once we have a category to talk about them. Huh? Um, then we also have C1, which is the collection of arrows, but these arrows usually are called morphisms. Now, we need to keep track of the fact that uh, each morphism has a source or domain and a target or, or codomain. So e each arrow goes out from one object and points to another one. And that uh, information also needs to be part of the description of the category. And that can be done by two maps called um, D and C maps. Um, so D, the D map assigns to every arrow its domain, or in other words, its source. And C will assign to every arrow its codomain, or in other words, the, uh, the target. That's not it yet, right? We, we still have more structure in a category. Um, for every object, for every object, we have a specific arrow that loops into that object. So that can be encoded by um, a, a map E that chooses for every object an arrow uh, for, for that object. We will call this the identity morphism map. And finally, we have composition. So one, two, three, four, five, six things together give us a category. Not yet. We still want to impose axioms on the structure, right? Um, and I'm going to now write down um, equations that will capture um, the geometry of these drawings that I've been making. Um, Prof, um, I want yes. to ask a question. The identity morphism map is subjected to the object in the category. Yes. Okay. okay, thank you.
sorry. Um, this I, I just want to ask: Are we upsetting Russell in some way by writing this as a tuple? This is a tuple of collections. Okay, so a tuple of collections is fine. So it's a I'm higher. Not used to working it's, with collections. We are at the higher level, higher universe. So if we want. Um, a proper uh, set theoretic treatment of category theory, we will have to work in, in a universe of set that has multiple layers of universes. Okay, thank you. So let me start writing the, the laws down. Okay, maybe we should first say, um, to clarify what, what these maps, what kind of inputs they have and what, what kind of outputs they have, right? So the domain map um, is a map from um, morphisms to objects. It assigns to every morphism an object, right? Um, the codomain map is also a map from morphisms to objects. Now, I actually, started writing it this way, but I, I want to not do that because for someone who uh, getting to know these things for the first time, it might become very confusing to have, to seeing these arrows along with those ones, which because these two are very different kinds of arrows, right? So instead of writing it this way, let me just say that D, let me write it in words. So D assigns, a morphism to every object. And when I say assigns, I mean that it's a function. So it, it assigns a unique morphism to every object. Ah, sorry, it's the other way around, right? Um, I mix that one up. It assigns an object to every morphism. Now C does the same thing. Maybe we can put them together. So both C and D assign an object to every morphism. Um, the E map assigns a morphism. to every object. This was the question that was asked earlier. Now let's state what uh, a circle does. Circle assigns a morphism to every pair of morphisms such that the codomain of F equals the domain of G. Let me explain that. If I go back to this picture, I only want to compose G and F when F goes into wherever G goes out from. If, if they don't match, I don't want to compose them. I only want to compose them in that case, which is very meaningful in terms of the transitivity idea, right? Um, but what is this case? What does it mean that F goes into wherever G goes out from using our terminology? Well, here, uh, Y is the codomain of F and X is the domain of, of F, right? And at the same time, Y is the domain of G, where the codomain of G is Z, right? And so you see uh, the fact that Y goes into the same place as G goes out from is just the fact that the codomain of F equals the domain of G, which is what we wrote here. Codomain of F equals the domain of G. So this is uh, describing now these maps on, which, on what they act and what their outputs are, right? 
but it still doesn't mean that the associativity ident identity rules automatically hold and, and neither it means um, uh, what picture we will get when we actually compute the composite we actually want to require that this composite leaves from the same object as f leaves from so we want to in, in input such information into our description of a category so this is the structural side of the category sorry about that um, and we will now start writing our equations down so we first maybe want to say that um, this identity error we choose for every object, the E of X, which we usually write as one subscript X, that this arrow is a loop from X to X. In this language of the map C, D, E and composition, how are we going to write that down? How can we express the fact that E of X needs to be a loop from X to X? We can say it has equal domain and co-domain. Mm -hmm. That's right. So the domain composed with E equals co-domain composed with E. And that is true for every um, so th there are two ways to write this, either using composition or, or using just evaluation of functions. And let me, once again, not to mix up with, the, with this composition here, let me write it the, the more primitive way. So C of E of X always equals um, X. And also D of E of X always equals X. Okay, so we took care of, of that part. Uh, the other thing we want to take care of is the fact that when I have two morphisms that have been composed, that this composite, so this is the, the map circle applied to the pair GF. Um, in fact, let me correct myself here and let me rewrite this as GF because that's how we were drawing it. So I now want to say that this composite arrow needs to have a, the same starting point as F does and the same end point as G does. So that would be saying that the, the domain of um, the composite of G and F equals the domain of F, right? Whereas the codomain of maybe this should go on this side. The codomain of the composite of G and F equals the codomain of G. What remains to complete defining a category is stating the associativity law and stating the identity laws. So let's see how we can do that. So associativity will be just stating that composite of H with composite of GF is the same as composite of composite of HG with F. And the identity law will be saying that um, composite of the codomain of F, well, the identity of the codomain, right? So the E of the C of F with F must equal F. So what does that mean? Here I have F, X, Y, and here I have identity Y, right? And I want that composite to equal still to F. So I've just encoded identity of Y as E of, so I've encoded this thing as E of C of F, Y, because Y is clearly C of F here, right? And then what is the E of that? That's the identity of Y, which is that. So this thing here 
is just the same as, as this thing here. Um, and the other identity law, the, the one on the other side, um, will be saying that the composite of F with the identity of the domain of F equals F. Okay. I hope I haven't missed anything. If you notice I have, please let me know. Otherwise, if I haven't missed anything, then we have a definition uh, for a category. So a category is a tuple of these objects where C0 and C1 are some collections of things called objects and morphisms, respectively. And then we have these mappings uh, whose behavior is described here. And there needs to be some properties that hold, which all of which are, are purely equational properties. So the fact that the axioms are purely equational, that's what makes a category into an algebraic structure. Algebra is about equations. The fact that we can draw categories, and in fact, not just draw, uh, moreover, these drawings are, you will certainly agree with me, these drawings are much more intuitive than formulas like this. Uh, the fact that we can draw um, what's happening inside a category uh, gives um, a category a geometric um, flavor. So in, when, you, when you do category theory, you're kind of combining in a sense, algebra and geometry. You usually prefer to make drawings because they allow you to see things much more quickly than having to write everything out. As you see, we, we had to write so many things out and doing that every time um, will be quite, um, it, it will taking, taking away if your attention from what you want to be focusing on. So you, we really work with categories as geometric objects, but they are only geometric in disguise, disguise in, 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 in their essence. They're actually algebraic objects because their axioms are all equational. They're not algebraic in the classical sense in a way that it, something would be algebraic in the classical sense if I only had one set and some data of functions or operations on it. Here we have two of them. This is called the two-sorted algebraic structure when there are two uh, sets at, uh, at play. But it actually turns out that we can um, present uh, axioms for a category using just one set, that will be the set of morphisms. But still, it will not be classically algebraic because our composition function is only defined partially. It's not defined for all pairs, as usually operations in algebra are defined for arbitrary pairs. It's only defined for some of them, the ones that satisfy this equation. So something like this is called an essential algebraic structure. Um, I would like to now open the floor for questions around this description of what a category is. And after that, we're going to move on and look at some interesting facts about category. If there was anything unclear in what we did so far, now it's a, it's a good time to ask. Um, it, it, it seems that in the definition of category, the um, collection of objects um, is somehow put in the background. You, you, what, what I mean by that is that you see, you, you've got um, um, morphisms can be, you know, like. Uh, you can perform operations on morphisms. You know this is what is you know the composition. Um, why in category theory um, is there no structure or you know uh, with regards to the collection of objects? You, you, you see, you understand. Uh, uh, yes, what I'm I, trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, okay. I understand that. Yes. Uh, so that will come later. We will have various things we can do with objects. For example, multiply them or tensor them and so on. But these things will be simultaneously operations on objects and morphisms as well. Um, from the onset, 
we don't do anything with objects. Um, and in a sense, it's because if you go back to these two motivating structures for a category, right? We don't really do anything with this monoid M because it's just one object. We can't really do it much with that. And in a pre-order, we don't really do anything uh, with objects. We just compare them. We, we don't. So that is, in, in a sense, that is the geometric flavor of the notion of a category. In, in a geometric structure, uh, you, you have more comparisons about um, um, uh, of your objects rather than performing some operations on objects themselves. Uh, now, at some point, we we want to do something with objects in a pre-order, like for example, considering supremums and infimums and, and so on. And then they turn out to be special cases of things called limits and colimits um, uh, in a in a category if you would order and switch around. Um, so we will do something with objects, but in the beginning we don't, just like in the pre-order in, in the beginning we don't do anything with objects. Uh, sorry, Prof, I would like to ask about the uh, the names uh, like arrows, morphism, and map. As far as, uh, as long as the category theory is concerned, can we just use them interchangeably or uh, we need to be careful on the type of category we are talking about? Uh, that's a very good question, thank you. So morphism is completely interchangeable with arrow. Some authors also like to call them maps, but some others don't like that tradition because map usually means uh, a function between sets. So when you're in the category of sets where morphisms are actually functions, then yes. But in a general category, I personally wouldn't call arrows maps, but some other uh, category theories do that. Um, the, the most common terminology is morphism. Some prefer to, to call morphisms arrows. Uh, that certainly doesn't cause any ambiguity, but if you start calling them maps, it, there is a little danger that there might be some ambiguity. Um, for example, it might be to the reason that you're working in a um, specific category where arrows are actually functions between sets. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so if there are no other questions, then let us list some of the standard examples of categories. Uh, I'm not going to go back to monoids and preorders. I think it is obvious from this discussion that monoids and preorders form categories the way they've been pictured here. So every monoid can be seen as a single object category. In fact, the two concepts are equivalent. Um, every single object category actually is a monoid. And also every pre-order can be seen as a category. But there are many more examples and that's what I, I would like to uh, mention here. Maybe I will still mention those, but I will not talk any more about them. So. A monoid is a single object category, and a preorder is a category too. Now, when you say when you say that something is a category, you have to be careful because you see how many things are involved in defining a category. So you have to actually. Very, make it very clear, what are your objects? What are your morphisms? Uh, how do you regard morphisms uh, in terms of their domains and codomains? What are the identity maps and what is composition? Now, instead of listing all of these things, if, if it's kind of obvious um, how these things would be defined, then we don't list them and just say something as simple as 
the pre-order is a category. Okay, I hope that remark is clear. Um, now, in a sense, a single monoid or a single pre-order, they are in, in some sense primitive categories in the sense that the objects of those categories themselves do not have an inner structure. Well, maybe I'm not quite right. So a monoid does have an in inner structure because this uh, single object itself is a set. So it has some inner structure, right? Um, but at least it's primitive in the sense that there is only one uh, object and there are no, no other objects. Whereas in the pre-order, the, the points X, Y, Z, they are just some abstract entities. They, they don't really have any inner structure. Um, while these two examples of categories are highly relevant, especially in terms of motivating some ideas in, in category theory and illustrating some other ideas, uh, they're not the reason why category theory um, is useful. Uh, the reason why category theory is useful is that you can create categories uh, of, of more complex structure than these, where your objects have very could have very rich inner structure. But of course, when you look at, at these objects as a category, you you kind of dismiss that structure. But but it's there. Okay, it's there in the sense that it affects on the behavior of uh, of composition of morphisms, for example. So it is such categories that are uh, really the motivation why one wants to develop the theory of categories. And, and the first of, of, of these is the category of sets. This category is usually denoted like this. Well, I said earlier that when we describe an example of a category, we have to list the whole set of data, right? So we have to do all of that. Huh? So let's actually do this in detail for, for this specific example. And then when we move to other more similar, uh, other similar examples, then maybe we will skip there and assume that it's uh, um, recoverable from the little information we might provide. So let's spell out each of these ingredients in the category of sets. So we will have to describe what C0 is, what C1 is, what D is, what C is, what E is, and what composition is. This is the collection of all sets. And I'm putting all in quotation marks because of this issue with Russell's paradox. So as I said before, if I want to formalize this in an axiomatic uh, set theory approach, then I would want to be considering um, sets of two sizes, ordinary sets and collections. Uh, and then I'm taking sets of lower size and forming a collection of those. And that will be of higher size, but it is still part of my axiomatic, so everything is fine. Um, the C1 will be the collection of triples x, y, f, where x, y are sets, and f is a subset of the Cartesian product such that it's a function. Um, what does that mean that it's a function? It means that um, for every x in x, there exists a unique y in y, such that the pair x, y belongs to f. I want to ask a question here. Why did I need to, so in describing these morphisms, which kind of intuitively, intuitively seem to be simply functions, right? Why did I need to include the information about the domain of the function and the codomain in, in this description? Why, why didn't I just say that 
C1 is the collection of just functions. So, so what I'm trying to achieve here is that if, if I've got X and Y, I, I want to think of function um, from X to Y in terms of just the set of order pairs. So that's what a function is, right? Why do I need to present F as a triple? Any input on that? I'm not quite certain why you need the domain, but the codomain can't necessarily be recovered from F, right? So in order for our C function to be able to actually okay. say what the codomain is of F, we need to put it in the triple. That's a very good remark. Um, let me respond to that after the other remark. Yes. Uh, oh, is it to, ins to ensure that uh, composition holds, that we can compose? Uh, well, uh, even before we compose, um, we need to, to have, later on, we need to define these D and C maps, right? So knowing what is F, I need to be able to say what is it, its codomain and what is its domain. But codomain of F is not recoverable from F. For example, uh, I mean, as Jan said, so for example, if I take um, a set of real numbers and I consider the function that maps x to e to the x and I wouldn't want to think of this as an arrow from r to r but the problem is that uh, is a set of pairs it consists of pairs x e to the x right where x is a real number uh, and the values of this function they are only positive real numbers so just this set of pairs doesn't really tell me what codomain is, right? Um, I wanted the codomain to be R. So in, in a sense, Nathan, what you said also is valid. I, I do want to consider uh, this specific function, e to the x function, as an arrow from R to R later to compose with it with other things that depart from R. So in a sense, what you said is also valid. But the problem is uh, already not just with composition, but already uh, when we try to define the codomain map. On the other hand, the domain map um, is still defined because when I have the set of order pairs, I will just project on the first components and that will be my domain since function is to be defined everywhere in its domain. So uh, Jean was actually quite right in remarking that we don't really need um, to, to specify x in the triple, we could have disregarded x and achieved the same effect. Uh, but for the sake of uh, symmetry and, and also clarity that, that you can see exactly what is domain and codomain, it might, some people might prefer to present it as a triple. Um, in the end though, we will disregard the triple and, and simply write the entire triple just by writing f. Okay, so that's the collection of um, morphisms. And now we can, thanks to this triple notation, now we can uh, um, write what D and C do. Uh, D of X, Y, F is X. C of X, Y, F is Y. E of X is the triple x x identity x and uh, composition is the usual composition of functions so if i have x uh, well maybe i should put here y z g if i want to compose that with x y f and that is defined as x z and here i put the composite of the two functions g composed with f and let me just remind you, or maybe just show you, if you haven't seen this before, the, the set theoretic notation for composition uh, is a set of ordered pairs. It will be the set of pairs x, z from x cross z, such that there exists a y in y, such that x, y, is in F and YZ is in G. Of course, 
in the end, we will be writing y such as x, y is in f, we will be writing this as f of x, since we know by the definition of a function that such y is unique, right? Uh, we will not really be using this pair notation eventually. I'm just showing you the pair notation to kind of show you how we are formalizing everything in set theory. Um, and similarly here, the z will be just written as g of y. And then composition is usually defined through that notation just by saying that g composed with f applied to x is g applied to f applied to x. So if you sub if you do the substitutions here, put that y in there, that you you get this formula, right? Okay. Um, now we have now described all this data that should constitute a category. It is of the right kind that can be confirmed that um, the type of data that we wanted to have, we do have such type of data. And then we can further co confirm that all the e equations that define a category hold. And this is another thing one usually skips in exposition. It's just a, a very simple exercise to confirm these things. Um, but, uh, well, because it's such a simple exercise, leaving it for the reader to confirm for himself or herself, maybe even without writing anything down, uh, is more efficient than writing everything in the text. Um, so we will follow that tradition and leave this for you to confirm if you have some doubts that um, the described data indeed forms a category. Okay, I, I now want to move away with being so meticulously precise because, um, first of all, because I'm hoping that most of, of the participants here, you are, already are um uh, have some um experience in, in set theoretic precision um so it might be annoying to to see everything spelled out so precisely because it because if it was 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 uh written imprecisely you would know how to make it precise and imprecise notation gives a shorter way of uh, and more intuitive way of seeing things um and secondly is uh, because it takes time to make everything precise um, and, and one then misses the intuition uh, that one wants to explore. So it, it, this is not to say that, that, that any single piece of category theory is imprecise. So uh, although in, in the books of category theory, in, in the research papers and so on, this geometric pictorial way of, uh, of working is very, very common and very well adopted um, because category in disguise is geometric only. I mean, it's actually an algebraic structure, right? Transforming that geometry into uh, more precise exposition is a very trivial process. It is so trivial that we can afford to, to talk in the geometric language. The same cannot be said for other areas of mathematics. For example, when you do trigonometry and you want to, for instance, uh, prove the, uh, the rule that uh, formula for cosine of, of, of the sum of two angles, right? You draw a picture, <laughs> but then in your picture, you've chosen your angles to be positions in a certain way, and then you have to check for other positions as well that the same uh, similar argument would hold. Here in category theory, we don't encounter such situations where the picture only gives us a special case of what we want to prove. The pictures actually will be representing the fully general situations. Um, so pictorial uh, language does not compromise on, on, on actual precision. OK. Um, and so I will now follow a bit more intuitive description for the next category. And now here we actually have a choice. We have a choice which example to consider. And I would like to ask you to give me a suggestion. After I make the following claim, any kind of mathematical structure that you've encountered can be turned into a category. 
Well, this claim is ridiculously trivially true because you can take trivial category, uh, which is not very interesting. In many different ways, you can trivialize the construction of a category. But uh, the more precise claim is that in most cases, uh, you can turn your mathematical structures into a meaningful category whose understanding will, will give you some meaningful information about those structures. Um, and in fact, that is the, the whole point of category theory to uh, do that. And it, it also explains why the term category is chosen for a category. The, the term category roughly means uh, concept. Um, so if we are working with the concept of a set, the associated category, the category of sets is supposed to capture the entirety of the concept of a set. And that's why we also denote the category of sets just by writing set. All right, now let's um, experiment my claim. Name your favorite mathematical structure and, and let's see if I will be able to turn it into a meaningful category. Groups. Groups, Nathan. Yeah. Okay. Well, th this. Thank you. That you're very kind to me. This is an easy, easy one. The category of groups. It's denoted GRP. So, in light of what I said earlier, I'm just going to tell you what are objects and morphisms. At least I'm going to write them out what they are, and then and the rest. It should be obvious how the rest works. Um. So in this category, objects are groups. Recall that a group is a set G with a binary operation and identity element, such that for every element, there is also an inverse element. So this part should be a monoid. And the extra requirement on a monoid is that every element is invertible. So these are my objects and morphisms are group homomorphisms. So these are maps between groups that preserve uh, the group operations. The category of groups is one of the most important categories in category theory because a, a, a large portion of, of the study of categories emerged by trying to abstract away from the category of groups and see what features it has. And then these features have been uh, investigated in general categories and applied to other special categories. Um, the first paper on category theory introduced the notion of a category uh, that was by Saunders McLean and Samuel Edinburgh. And the second paper uh, that came on, on categories was by Saunders McLean alone. And, and, and here in that paper, he introduced a few general notions in, in general categories motivated from the category of groups. So this is a very important category. We'll probably return to this category a few times. Composition of, of uh, group homomorphisms is just the usual composition of group homomorphisms. So if you compose group homomorphisms as functions, you it turns out it's still a group homomorphism. So that's how you get a category where also identity morphisms are the usual identity maps, which, which are obviously group homomorphisms. So we have the category of groups. All right, let's uh, test my claim out a few more times. Um, the next favorite uh, favorite uh, structure. Victor spaces. Okay, this is... Uh, Another very fundamental category, we could consider uh, the category of vector spaces over a field F. More generally, we could, we could have talked about the category of modules over a ring. Of course, when a ring is a field, we get vector spaces, right? So what are objects here? Objects are vector spaces. Uh, keep in mind that it's up to us to choose how to define objects and morphisms, right? Even, even when I define objects, I can still choose how to define morphisms. Uh, but there is sometimes there is one choice which is more natural and more useful maybe than other choices. And this is what we're doing here. 
objects are vector spaces. And morphisms are linear maps between vector spaces. Once again, composition of linear maps is still linear, and, and so we get a, a category. Um, next favorite structure. Uh, sorry, Prof, to interrupt. I have noticed that you haven't mentioned yet uh, the, the concept of small and large categories, because uh, the categories that you are talking about right now, uh, they are large categories. So I, are you going to speak about it later or? Uh, well, it's, a category is small. I can, I, can I can just answer that comment right now. So a category is small when this collection and also this one themselves are sets. For example, the category of sets is not small because the collection of all sets is not a set. But uh, a pre-order where P is a set is small because both objects and morphisms will be collections that are sets. Does that answer your request? Yes, it does, it does. Um, Prof, I want to ask, in that sense, could we think, or could we say all the single object categories are actually small? Yes. No, well, okay. uh, sorry, uh, I made a mistake. As long as uh, the, um, the collection of morphisms is set. All right. Uh, good morning, Prof. I also would like to ask, um, just elaborate a little bit more on what you said when you said that uh, sometimes the morphisms that we choose, there are others that are more natural than others. Let me do that. Thank you very much for that uh, question. Um, I'm going to go back to the category of sets and I'm going to show you another category where the objects will be the same, but morphisms will be something slightly different. In fact, that will be my, my next example. The category of sets and relations. In this category, objects are sets. Morphisms are no longer functions between sets. A morphism from a set X to a set Y is a triple. This time we do need to specify both X and Y. And I'm, going, I'm not going to call it F anymore. Um, I'm going to call it R for the reasons that will be evident now. Where X and Y are sets. And R is a subset of X cross Y. Remember, a function was defined as a subset of X cross Y with, with additional property that for every X there is unique Y. Here we don't put any property. So, so in other words, morphisms are what, what we call relations between sets. We can compose relations. In fact, composition of functions is a special case of composition of relations. If I have two relations, R from X to Y and S from Y to Z, their composite is defined as, well, if we think of these as triples once again, X, Y, R and Y, Z, S, then the composite is X, Z, um, and the, the set of ordered pairs is the set of all ordered pairs xz, such that there exists a y, such that um, xy is in R, 
and yz is in s. And now I ran out of space, so let me create a bit more space. And, and you see this definition is identical to the definition we gave earlier for functions. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, but I also had uh, in mind, um, <clears throat> um, for instance, there would, okay, uh, going through a, a, a book on category theory, they would give an example of, um, Um, bounded linear maps on uh, and also um, what's this? So you would have a certain category where you have the object as you, you indicated they are the same, but then for the morphisms they would be slightly different. And um, yeah, why would you choose one particular or a natural uh, choice over the other in some instances? Is it mainly or purely driven by application or a particular problem at hand or? Yeah, exactly. Why? It's driven by application. Um, so, okay, now let's let's talk about a little bit about uh, the, uh, the nature of how you apply category theory to, to the study of certain specific structures. Uh, you've got certain mathematical structures and you, Maybe you've solved some problem in the context of those structures. But maybe your structures are themselves quite complex things. And so maybe either it's difficult to present your solution or, or, or difficult to, to find a solution, um, or you simply want to understand uh, whether your solution of the problem is transferable to other mathematical structures as well. So what you do then is you observe in, in, in your problem, you observe what is the essential ingredient of your structures that you were using. And then you consider maps between structures which preserve that ingredient. And then you try to rephrase whatever you were working with, you, you try to rephrase this in the language of composition of those maps. And if you are successful in that, then you have abstracted away from those structures to a general category, thanks to considering those specific maps. One type of maps might allow you to abstract, but other type of maps might not. So it depends on what you're working on. And, and so the compatibility of what you're working on with uh, the choice of maps is what comes into play here. Okay, bro. Yeah, just another quick question. Uh, so obviously this latest category is not uh, known as the category of set, it's known as uh, the category of relations. The category of relation is something still different. This category is the category of sets and relations. Usually when we say two things, the first refers to objects and the second refers to morphisms. In the category of relations, relations will be objects. And morphisms will be something else, and I can we can I can show you that as well. So let's consider the category of binary relations. Well, maybe some authors call this thing the category of relations, but if if we did choose a name by by the nature of arrows, then we should have called this not the category of sets, but the category of functions, right? So you, more commonly, the category of relations is a category where uh, objects, and there are a few ways to, to go, go about it. We can define relations just on, on a single set or, or between two sets. And, and more common is to just consider the relation a single set. So objects are pairs, X R, where X is a set, 
and R is a relation on X. In other words, R is a subset of X cross X. And a morphism from one such pair to another such pair is a function from X to Y such that, and, and now I have some choices to make here, and, and, and one possible definition is uh, for with a different choice, I will have a different category. So, so one possible definition, which is the standard one, is to say that for every x1 and x2, well, I actually don't need to say this even. So for every x1 and x2, if x1, x2 is in R, then uh, f of x1, f of x2 is in S. And this shouldn't be too surprising because when my relation is a pre-order relation, let's say, let's say both of them are some pre-order relation, not necessarily the same, although I denote them in the same letter, then of course this just means that if x is x1 is less or equal to x2, then f of x1 is less or equal to f of x2. So I get the notion of an uh, increasing function, right? Well, um, maybe not strictly increasing, but increasing function. And so um, the category of pre-orders with morphism being uh, uh, increasing functions, uh, you can think of this as living inside this larger category of category of uh, sets equipped with a binary relation. And uh, the list goes on. We can create lots of different examples. I would like to uh, mention one more, uh, which kind of links back to uh, linear algebra, category of matrices. We can have this category for any, uh, in fact, ring R. So matrices over a ring R. If, if you don't know what a ring is, then just think of this as real numbers. So what are objects? Objects are natural numbers. Zero, one, two, and so on. And a morphism from N to M is an M by N matrix. So A has entries A11 all the way up to A1N. That's the first row. And then the last row is AM1 all the way up to AMN. What is composition? Can anyone guess what the composition will be? Matrix multiplication. That's right. You can you can check that the dimensions match from from the diagram, so that the matrices are actually you can actually multiply them. Now, in in lots of standard <coughs> mathematical material, whether it's applied or pure, uh, this uh, one often con considers algebras formed out of matrices, but then one restricts to, to square matrices so that, uh, in other words, those matrices that are loops, right? So N by N matrices. Uh, and then one gets monoids. And in fact, this has a richer structure than just a monoid. Um, and these things uh, in suitable context are called matrix algebras. Um, but they have this limitation that, it's limiting just to the looping arrows. And now this category allows you to consider all matrices of all dimensions at once as one algebraic structure. And it 
turns out that this category is very closely related to the category of vector spaces. And that relationship is given by representing a linear map as a matrix once you choose basis. Of course, we're talking about finite dimensional vector spaces. We will come back to that uh, link between these two categories, which conceptualize the uh, representation of linear maps as, uh, as matrices. So examples are numerous. And along the way, we will probably encounter further and further examples. Uh, can we also maybe mention the category of small categories? Because it's quite uh, a special one. Why not? Yes, we can do that. But not yet, because if we mention that, we, we then have to define what a functor is. And we haven't done that yet. Um, so there are two things. OK, now that we've kind of defined categories and we've looked at some examples, there are two directions we could take. We could start investigating things inside a category, or we could take several categories and try to relate them together with each other. OK. Um, and I would like to. I would like for us to, because also we don't have too much time um, left and not to make things more complex for the first lecture, I would prefer that we first investigate inside the category. And the next time we can start comparing several different categories with each other. So let us look at some notions that we can define inside the category to, to do something interesting. Um, okay, so we, we don't want to just give some abstract definition and then look at these examples. We, we, we now want to do it the other way around, where we begin with um, some construction that we know works for familiar mathematical structures. And then we try to abstract this construction, formulate it in such a way that it has a meaning in an arbitrary category, and then maybe see what its other examples are. So let us go back to maybe the simplest situation here, the category of sets. Could you uh, give an example of some construction that deals with sets? Um, and then based with based on uh, how how difficult it will be to abstract it, then we, we will either do that or, or 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 try another example. What I'm asking is to formulate some construction with sets. I mean, previously it was asked whether we do anything with objects, right? Uh, in a category, well, we we certainly do lots of things with sets specifically, we could take one construction of what we can do with sets and then see how we could do this for general objects in a general category. Uh, the notion of an injection function. That's a good one. Any other suggestions? Uh, the Cartesian product of sets. The Cartesian product is a good one too. Let's take the third one, and then we get to work. The power set of a set. Fantastic. So we now have three interesting constructions. Can we abstract the following ideas or constructions? or concepts from the category of sets to a general category. And the three that we've identified is in, one is the concept of injective function. 
the other is the concept of a Cartesian product of two sets. And the third one was the power set. So, uh, in fact, <laughs> it is coincidental perhaps that uh, they are in increasing uh, order of difficulty. And hence, it would be natural to then begin with the first one. Uh, this is one. Uh, this is something we already looked at uh, one of the informal sessions, so it might be a bit of repetition for some of you. Um, let's try to formulate the definition of an injective function uh, in the language of composition alone. So we, we we know very well what is an injective function in the language of elements, right? So uh, the function f from x to y is injective. It means that um, f of x1 equals f of x2 must imply x1 equals x2. Okay, now because we did look at this before or already, maybe I'm not going to ask questions since uh, some of you would, would know how to answer them because of our previous engagement. So let me simply develop the, the solution to this problem. Uh, without much input at the beginning at least. Um, so in, in that informal session, what we discussed was how we can um, think of elements as arrows. So that, that's basically the, the, the thing we want to do here, right? So the, the x and one and the x2, they're elements of x, right? We want to turn elements into arrows. How to do that? Well, uh, with sets, we can do that actually. We could consider the singleton set, and then uh, an element of X can be described as a function from that singleton set. So let me do this vector notation here to distinguish this from the actual element. So what function is this? It's the function that maps the singleton, uh, the, the unique element of the singleton set, into uh, to X one. So that's true for each one and two, for i being one and two. OK, but now what is a singleton set in a category? That is a, another question to be answered, uh, which can be answered. And we already saw that in one of the other sessions, but we will come back to it later. But it turns out we actually don't need to answer that question. All we can do is just replace the singleton set with any other set. Indeed, look, if I had any two functions, x1 and x2, OK, let me not call them x1 and x2 anymore. Maybe I should call them x1 and x2. If I had any two functions, and let me draw this function f as well. OK, before I move to the case of general w, let me remark that the value of the function f at x1 in this vector notation can be represented as um, the value of the composite of f with x1 vector at uh, that unique element, right? That, that's fairly obvious, right? So if x1 maps singleton to, to x1, then when I map it further by f, I will get exactly f of x1. So the same is true for x2 as well. So this gives a, a way to transition from evaluating a function at an, at an element to composing a function with another one. And with that in mind, I now claim that when a function is injective, f1 composed with some um, other function I don't want to call this x1, not to confuse it with the other one. Let me call it something else. Let me call it w1 and w2 here. So I want to claim that if f composed with w1 equals f composed with w2, then the two functions w1 and w2 will equal. 
And, and why did I think of writing something like this down? Because this translation of evaluation in terms of composition gives me translation of the two sides of equality in this form. And the other side just remains the same where W1, W2 are kind of abstractions of, of the elements X1 and X2. But let's actually prove that this more general rule holds for injective functions. Uh, so I want to prove that W1 equals W2. So required to prove that uh, W1 of every element of uh, W, and let's call that element um, um, A, right, equals W2 of, of the same A. This is what I want to prove. OK, um, I'm going to apply F to both sides. I will have F of W1 of A. Now, OK, let me apply F on one side. Now, what is F of W1 of A? That's the same as F composed with W1 of A, right? But what is F composed with W1? We are assuming here that, that that's the same as F composed with W2. We are required to prove this under the assumption that, that the, uh, the left side of the implication holds, right? So let's write this assumption out as well. Assume that this composite is equal to the other one. And then this is what we want to prove. Um, by the assumption, then this is the same as that. And that by definition of composition of functions is this. And now, um, Remember, we said f is injective. So here is my x1. Here is my x2. By injectivity of f, they must be equal. But their equality is exactly what I wanted to prove. So I'm done. I proved that every injective function um, will satisfy this more general rule. What about the other way around? Is it true that if a function satisfies this more general rule, then it's injective? Well, let's say a function does satisfy this more general rule. Then specialize the rule in the case when w, remember the, this rule is for arbitrary w and arbitrary w1 and w2. And we can specialize this in the spe specific case when w is a single set. But we already remark that in that specific case when w is a singleton set this is exactly a, a, a copy of of this because this matches with that and, and the other one matches with the other one right i mean through, through these equalities so we have now a purely functional um, description of injective functions which does not make use of elements at all which is the following, and, and this now is a is a very important notion in category theory. So it's called the monomorphism, a narrow F that satisfies that property. And we can now formulate the definition a morphism F from X to Y is a monomorphism when for any object w and any two morphisms uh, w1 and w2 both from w to x uh, we have that this implication holds And the discussion previously can be written out as a theorem saying that in the category of sets, a morphism is a monomorphism if and only if. Um, it is an injective function.
Would anyone like to ask any questions before I move on? Uh, can we equivalently define this by requiring that there exists some morphism G from Y to X, <laughs> such that G of F is the identity? Uh, this is another approach to defining a monomorphism. Thank you very much, Jean, for that suggestion. Uh, let us consider that other approach and let us establish the link between the two. So what is another approach? Um, let's write this down. Another approach to the same abstraction. When you have an injective function, right? Let me draw a diagram for an injective function. Uh, if this is our x and y, and the function is f, we can always go back, right? Uh, we can map back the elements to the place where they came from, those that come from somewhere, and those that don't come from anywhere, we could map them to um, some randomly chosen element here. So these are mapped to, to the same place where they came from, and, and, and those that don't, don't come, they're mapped to some randomly chosen element. This function in the other direction, let's call this function f star. I don't want to call it f inverse because it's not two-sided inverse. So if I start from x, go there, and then come back, I get back to where I started. But if I start at y, I might not get back where I start because I might start outside the, the range of f, the image of f, and I go there. Then I end up in the image of f, and that will be different from where I started. So we only have um, partial inverse law here that f star composed with f equals identity of x, but not the other composite. The other composite isn't equal to identity. Um, there is a bit of, of a problem, though. Um, so I actually want to turn this colon into a question mark. And when, when Jean suggested this, he didn't realize what the problem was, and neither did I. Uh, but there actually is a problem. Not every injective function f has the associated f star. Would anyone like to give an example of a function f for which f star does not exist? Would this be some technicality about the empty function? That's right. So let's consider um, the empty set. And let's consider here a singleton set. This function f is injective. Why? Because injective rule says that for every x1 and x2 in the empty set, something must hold, namely if f of x1 equals f of x2, then x1 must equal x2. Um, but because empty set does not have any elements, right? This um, statement is true um, in a trivial way. It says, if there were elements, then something should happen. But there are no elements, so the, the statement is true. So uh, the function from the empty set to star, namely the function which was uh, representation as a set of order pairs is the empty set itself is injective, but we can't be able we won't be able to find the function backwards, in fact none, because um, a function must map every element somewhere, and the star then will have to be mapped somewhere in here, but the, the set is empty, so it, it can't be mapped anywhere. So this is the only exception. Otherwise, the two notions seems to be the same, right? Well, they actually are the same. If f's for which f star exists and f's for which it doesn't. Um, there is nevertheless a notion in, in category theory that abstracts this idea. 
and here it is. Um, a split monomorphism is a morphism f from x to y such that there exists a morphism backwards and that morphism is not necessarily unique so I'm, not, I'm just going to call it g for which composite of g and f equals identity x and in fact we have a theorem that every split monomorphism is a monomorphism but backwards is not true not every monomorphism is a split monomorphism and the counter example is even here so this is a split monomorphism sorry this is a monomorphism which is not a split monomorphism right this is a monomorphism in the category of sets which is not split however if a monomorphism is split then it will be in particular monomorphism and and that's why it's called a split monomorphism with an adjective and let's try to prove that so let me show you what what it means to to write proofs out using diagrams so we are given uh, a morphism f for which we have this g going backwards okay and, and we know that g composed with f is identity of x and um i now want to prove that f is a monomorphism and remember what it means it means that in such a scenario with w1 and w2 f composed with w1 being equal to f composed with w2 must imply that w1 and w2 are equal so let's see what this implies any ideas what to do this is our assumption and we want to get from there eventually that w1 equals w2 any ideas Uh, well, if we compose G with both of them, mm, that that's should be right. almost directly implied. We compose both sides with G. This is how the brackets will be arranged. Then we use associativity of composition to rearrange brackets this way. Then we use the fact that um, GF was identity, but for writing that fact out, I need to, for using that fact on the board, I need to increase the space on my board. So uh, we use this fact, so that will give us identity X here. And then we use the identity law, right? Identity X composed with W1 is just W1. And the same on the other side. And we, we get what we wanted. We, we have from here, so that thing implies that thing. Now, you see, in the category of sets, um, maybe I, I should just put a mark here that the proof is finished. In the category of sets, uh, it was just these empty maps that were that were monomorphisms that are not split. But 
In other categories, there, there can be much more of them that are not split. Let's look at the category of groups. In the category of groups, there are more um, monomorphisms that are not split more than in sets. Who would like to give a non-trivial example of a group polymorphism, a group monomorphism? Sorry. Uh, okay. Let me let me first tell you that one can prove without too much difficulty, and that might be an interesting exercise to do. That actually, in the category of groups, monomorphisms turn out to be injective functions, in injective group homomorphisms. So we're now looking for an injective group homomorphism uh, that doesn't have this one-sided inverse. If you're familiar with um, a bit with group theory, you might want to um, suggest which injective group homomorphism to consider for which we will never be able to, to go back. This F star will not exist. Even though in, in, in the world of groups, we don't have empty sets anymore because every group needs to have at least one element, at least the identity element. So it's not because of the emptiness that um, the, the splitting fails. Any ideas? So what happens if we take um, even integers, thinking of this as uh, a group under addition, and we consider the um, injective function into integers, the embedding of even integers into integers. Is there a way to go back? I mean, this is clearly an injective function. And one can prove that it's a monomorphism by a similar argument as we did for sets. Um, you see this proof can actually be copy pasted and will work for, for the proof that an injective group homomorphism is, is, a, is a monomorphism. So f of um, 2n is mapped to 2n. I hope you agree that even numbers form a subgroup of, of the group of all integers. Uh, it's closed under addition. Zero is even, uh, and that's and also the inverse of an even number is in, even the additive inverse. So this is a group, and and f will be a group homomorphism. Um, why can't we go back? Well, imagine we could. We'll have to specify where one will be mapped to, right? Um, let's say one is mapped to zero. Well, that will be a problem because um, if one is mapped to zero, then two will have to map to, well, two is equal to one plus one, right? Surely you agree with that. So it will have to map to F star one plus F star one. So that will be zero plus zero, which is zero. We can't afford that to, to happen because uh, two is f of something, right? So we could rewrite two as f of two. And the whole idea of going back is that f of f of two and then f star of it must equal two. So we will get the two equals zero, which cannot happen. Therefore, um, so this equality, um, which of the which equalities it fails? That this one, because two is not equal to zero, so we can't have this. 
if star of one can't be zero. Um, can f star of one of of, uh, of one sorry, can f star of one be some other number? We might want to make it one, but we don't have one available here, right? So the smallest number up to zero there is is two. So if it if it is equal to some two n where n is not zero, right? Then by similar argument as before, f star of two will have to be because two is equal to one plus one. It will have to be f star of one plus f star of one, and hence it will have to be two n plus two n, and that makes it makes it four n, right? Um, and there is no way four n will equal um, two, right? And to be honest, I don't know why I considered the zero case separately. Maybe just to um uh, maybe maybe just out of stupidity or just to entice you for for seeing the more general argument but um it doesn't work so this argument also proves the n equals zero case right because um all numbers in in 2z are of this form and whether or not n is equal to zero two can never equal four times n so you see, we have an, a, a monomorphism that's not split. So these two notions of monomorphism and split monomorphism are in general uh, quite different from each other. Although we do have implication in one direction, as we remarked in this theorem, that every split monomorphism is actually a monomorphism. 